lovely people my name is Emma and today I'm going to be filming my reading wrap up for the month of September so I believe I read 15 or 16 books in the month of September and it was generally a meh kind of month with a lot of sort of 3 to 3.5 star reads but with a few real standout titles in there so I'm going to go in chronological order so I don't miss anything and the first book I finished is The Autumn Throne by Elizabeth Chadwick this is book three of her Eleanor of Aquitaine trilogy which is a historical fiction that is set in the 1100s and is based on the real life individual of Eleanor of Aquitaine. The final trilogy follows the last third of Eleanor's life which includes her imprisonment from her husband Henry II and then her um, freedom, her interactions with her son Richard the Lionheart and then eventually her death. Uh, it was a generally strong trilogy overall but I do think the last book was probably the weakest of all of them just because it's naturally a slower part of Eleanor's life. Her time being imprisoned is not very interesting because she can't do much and the big kind of intrigue of her storyline is her political machinations and kind of her interactions with other members of the court. Um, and then naturally when she gets older she also kind of basically retires from public life and again that was fairly quiet as well. I do think the trilogy overall is very strong and Elizabeth Chadwick does a really phenomenal job of conveying, um, a, like dramatising what were real life events and does very very well with some of the limited information we have available about Eleanor of Aquitaine so I would still recommend it but book one, book two were definitely stronger. The next book I finished is Wrecker by uh, Noel O'Reilly. This is I believe a YA historical fiction though it doesn't actually tell you exactly when it's set which was one of my criticisms of the book. Um, it lacked any real kind of historical detail to ground it in reality which is what I personally look for in my historical fiction. I like my historical fiction to feel like I'm learning about history at the same time and this lacked any context for me to really feel like that. This is set in a rural village in Cornwall and it is a village that is rife with superstition and religion and generally um, it's sort of the conversation between the two and the main storyline follows um, a, an unmarried woman who uh, is slightly scandalous in the town and she actually finds a shipwrecked man and saves him from the water and he turns out to be a preacher who is determined to come to the village and save the individuals of the village and it's kind of the the fallout from him being introduced into this community. It was very atmospheric but I thought that the plot kind of hit the same sort of plot points you were expecting it to. None of the characters felt particularly fleshed out and the main characters were both rather unlikable so that combined with the lack of historical like accurate historical detail grounded in a genuine time period meant I probably only really gave it three stars it was fine but nothing special um it was suggested for people who are fans of the Essex Serpent and I do think it is basically the YA version of that book so if you're a fan of that book you may enjoy this one. The next book I finished was a super cute novella called Superior by Jessica Lack. This is a really adorable romance which is um, between the two assistants of a hero and a superhero and it is kind of their little love story and it was just a really fun warm light-hearted read it's only available on like ebook and kindle but it's super cheap it's a really short novella and i totally recommend everyone go read it it's a wonderful little like the the way that they meet and the way that the kind of characters develop is really sweet and it has some very kind of touching very tropey fanfic -y style scenes that i really appreciated um there was also an interesting discussion in it about um like the role of something like a superhero and kind of collateral damage and sort of what happens when they come bursting in and what does it mean to be a hero or a villain so it was doing a little bit more just than the gay romance between the two characters so I thought that it was really good fun and totally worth checking out. The next book I finished is Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell. This is a non-fiction book and it is a memoir of George Orwell's time in the Spanish um, army and it was in the Spanish resistance in particular in the time just before the second world war when there was the um, militia rising up against Franco who was a dictator at the time so it's his time with the Marxist army I believe or the socialist army um, there are a lot of acronyms in it I love Orwell's writing I think he's a fantastic writer regardless of what sort of topic he's dealing with and I really enjoy historical non-fiction because I think it can be such an interesting glimpse into that particular time period and I knew very little about Spain before the Second World War it definitely gets missed off in a lot of British curriculum because we're so focused on the Second World War part rather than some of the um, the things that happened in Spain that sort of set the stage for some of the stuff in Europe later so it was very interesting to read Orwell's experiences over there um, and in his kind of general tone of writing I think is wonderful. He made the decision to put a bunch of appendices in the book which cover 
um, sort of the political leanings of the world in general at that point and kind of what the different um, acronyms, acronyms and different parties were and I would have personally preferred them to be integrated better throughout the book. He discusses why he does that saying a lot of people don't like politics and I believe at the time he was getting a lot of criticism about his political writing so potentially it was sort of a reaction to um, criticism of the time but I would have preferred to have that integrated through because there were sections of it where I was a little bit confused as to who the different players were and sort of what the political leanings of the various groups were because I wasn't versed enough in that particular time period. But the detail is fantastic and I just, I love pretty much everything he touches. So um, yeah, a really great read. The next book I finished is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. This is a fiction and like a literary fiction which has actually won the Booker Prize last year and this was a buddy read with myself and a couple of people from university. Um, this is a really phenomenal book. I kind of shy away from lots of things that win the man book or, or get termed as kind of literary because I often find them to be very dense and impenetrable for, in my opinion, no real reason. But this one really surprised me. It follows 12 different women and it's sort of little vignettes and individual chapters on them but the women are grouped into like groups of three where they're kind of interconnected in that particular section. So you might have like a mother, a daughter and then a close family friend or something like that. Um, and it's just sort of a look at the very different ways that identity can intersect in the world as being a woman and for most of the women in this book being black and being um, queer and just kind of generally um, what it is like to occupy space in the world and to be kind of a, a fully fleshed, fleshed out individual and their kind of hopes and dreams and fears as such. There is a loose thread through um, and sort of a few scenes at the end that try and tie it all together that I personally actually didn't like. I would have preferred to not have the end uh, a couple of chapters where we're sort of forced to bump into these people again and kind of force them to interconnect in a more um, kind of coherent way. I really enjoyed the sort of brushing past of each other that happens in their various chapters um so that was kind of my only criticism for this one and it's also also worth mentioning that from a structural like stylistic point of view um the author is writing everything without any kind of punctuation and instead is sort of using line breaks um and it's it can be a little bit difficult to get into at the beginning but once you kind of sunk into it you do get a feel for it but that could be maybe a little bit intimidating when you first approach it but I would really recommend this I'm not someone who likes character driven stuff but I found this sort of slow real like deep dive into these different people's brains like strangely compelling um, and I, I really really enjoyed it it was a massive surprise read for me the next book I finished was my other buddy read of the month and that is Quality Land by Mark Uwe Kling this I was buddy reading with Amy from Amy Gets Lit and I will link her channel down below. She's fab, go check her out. Um, this is a speculative sci-fi dystopian-esque future fiction-y type thing which is kind of taking the idea of algorithms running our life and sort of continuing it to the nth degree. It is a world where um, products appear at your doorstep before you've even actually ordered them because they know what you want in that moment. Your partner is entirely dictated by a dating app that will alert you when um, the person you're with is no longer suitable. It's all about maximizing efficiency and entirely relying on computer-based algorithms. This is such a clever book. The actual plot of it is focused on three main characters. We have kind of a down and out character who is sort of from the, the lower working class and is feeling very um, dissatisfied with this lot in life. Then we have an artificial intelligence program that is actually running for president and is the first non-human to be running for president. Right up my street with that one. We all know how much I love AI narratives on here. I have a sci-fi video out recently that talks a lot about AI stuff. This nearly made the cut and then I realized that I hadn't actually done a up for it yet um, and then we have a government employee who is quite high up he's sort of from the the rich um, the richer class but he is a bit disgruntled and it's sort of the fallout of what happens from there this is the kind of book that is both overtly very clever but is also doing so much with its kind of subtext and there were so many little moments where I kind of read something and then went back and reread the sentence and was like oh I see what you did there that is very clever and it is also spookily spookily accurate for how the world seems to be going and has some really interesting discussions about the reliance of algorithms algorithm, algorithms oh that is hard to say right now um, and the fact that we tend to view sort of things that are run through computers as being infallible when actually it's human beings who are programming them which means we program in our own implicit biases genuine such a cool book and i'm really excited to see what else this author does and it's translated from german so if you are somebody trying to read more translated fiction like myself this one takes that box the next book i finished is devolution by max brooks 
Max Brooks is the author of World War Z, which is a very, very popular zombie book, and he is definitely trying to um, capture some of the the reasons why World War Z works really well, and I just don't think he's done it anywhere near as well in Devolution. So World War Z is like an oral history, so it's pretending to be a documentary about a genuine zombie war, and in a similar style, Devolution is looking at a kind of documentary style um, particular incident that has happened in the mountains of America. So there's been a volcanic eruption, and in doing so, this has cut off a small community who live up in the mountains and they're very like tech kind of people who just want to um like remote work and remove themselves from the city but the volcanic eruption has actually also forced a um kind of clan of sasquatches into this commune and chaos and death ensues as you can imagine the bulk of the story is told to you from the point of view of the diary of one of the people who is there and this is one of the things that i think didn't work very well I have very mixed feelings about this particular book. I think as far as horrors go, it was creepy and atmospheric in places and definitely did work well in that one. And I did enjoy the kind of scientific um, explanations for how Sasquatches could have evolved and like what connections they have to humans. Um, and I do think Max Brooks does do a decent amount of work to make that feel very realistic and believable. However, I do think that he was leaning on a lot of the kind of styles of writing that worked in World War Z and it just doesn't work in this one. Um, I have a whole Goodreads review where I go into more detail about it but probably if I was to pick out the one really frustrating thing is so many of these characters are so unbelievably bloody stupid and I know that the stupid character in horror is like a classic trope of our time but they they take this just to new heights of stupidity and I found that really infuriating and much of the plot would not work and would not go as disastrously badly had they not been flaming idiots constantly so um i will link my goodreads review down below if you want to go check it out um but yeah i had a, a mixed response lukewarm shall we say the next book i finished is china dream by uh ma Jian. this is a translated fiction and it is set in china and it is about a gentleman who works for the chinese government and he's working on a microchip that can be implanted and can basically report on your dreams and either wipe out dreams that are against the party or basically report if you're having kind of traitorous sort of dreams and he believes in his product so much that he's actually implanted it in him, in his head himself to experience it but unfortunately something has gone wrong and it's kind of his slow descent into madness um it's a little bit of a fever dream kind of book and the main character is deeply unlikable which i did kind of find got in the way at a few points for my actual enjoyment and i definitely was hampered by the fact that i don't know enough about china whether it be historically or currently to know basically what was dystopian future and what was like real life stuff um so i feel like i missed a few points in that but it was really like creepy and atmospheric and a really good example of dystopian fiction so I thought that it was definitely a really interesting read um, I just don't think I necessarily got as much out of it as I could have done had I had a different kind of background as a reader but this is why I really like um, approaching translated fiction because it does force you to kind of confront your gaps in your knowledge and like ah I can't fully appreciate this right now because I don't have the tools available and it's up to me as a reader to build those tools so this is a step in that right direction um but yeah genuinely very interesting and if you are interested in dystopian fiction in general I think that this is a great example of it the next book I finished is A Princess in Theory by Alyssa Cole this is a contemporary romance and is technically the start of a series and generally I had a good time but it's not my favorite from her so this one is about a young woman who um it turns out she is actually um um, like the sort of betrothed to an African prince who's from a country called Thisolo I believe um, and he, she has no idea and she's living in America and he comes over with his aide to try and track her down and kind of tell her about her like forgotten history and then to bring her back to his country and to be like yo we should probably get married or indeed yo we should probably like dissolve this um, and you know it was it was cute I liked both the main characters I think Alyssa Cole is a good writer the thing that I couldn't get over in this was the fact that he lies to her for quite a while which you know he pretends to be sort of of the common people so he can get to know her and like I like that trope you know it's great in the movie The Prince and Me like it's great in a few other fiction things like I'm here for that but when you're just lying about your identity that's one thing but when in proxy you're lying therefore about her identity that feels different because she has living relatives in the country that she's originally from and she has a whole kind of community that she doesn't know exists and he is drawing out that and like limiting that knowledge from her and that just feels different to me than 
just lying about his own identity. You know, I don't think lying is necessarily a great base for starting any relationship, but this one especially didn't really jam. So once we got past that, um, I had a better time and I am looking forward to the other books in the series because um, I like Alyssa Cole's writing and I think that she can definitely do um, kind of if it's a different trope, I'll have a better time basically, but this one, the trope just didn't quite work for me. The next book I finished is The Romanoffs by Simon, Simon Seberg Montefiore. This was a hangover left over from the History Challenge because it is a chunk of a book and it is a non-fiction covering the entire Romanoff line, which is like Russian royalty from 1613 to 1918 I believe. Look at that memory. So this is spanning 300 years of uh, royal lineage, which as you can imagine, takes a while and has a lot of characters which meant that I struggled with this book like I'm pleased I finished it and it is my first dip into Russian history so there is kind of an element of not having the background knowledge to be able to place into it, this in a context yet but this being like the first puzzle piece to be able to build up that picture but I do think that this is potentially the wrong place to start as a beginner because just each reign had so many um, different people who uh, like we spend such little time with and there wasn't really much detail about the global picture as a whole and many of the people have the same names because royalty loves naming um, their kids after previous kids like we do it in England we've had we've got a billion Henry's France has its Louis these guys the Russians have have their Catherine's and their Alexis and their Ivans and their Peters and like yeah it's a whole thing um, so because of that like I just I think this book is trying to do, do both too much and too little in equal measure and I probably would have enjoyed it more had it been broken down and kind of focused in more on individuals from it but it has been in some ways a good starting place I do have other people now I want to go and like learn more about and this is my first book in kind of my step for sort of learning more about Russian history so I'm naturally missing a lot of the context for it and the later sections of the book that brought it more towards a modern context when I did know some of the key players sort of globally like Napoleon and then once we started to get into the first world war kind of territory and the build up to that um, I don't like Queen Victoria I knew a bit more what was going on so therefore I could enjoy it more so I would still recommend this book in some ways then I finished Critical by Matt Morgan. This is a non-fiction memoir of a doctor who works in an IC unit or intensive care unit and this was fine. <laughs> Let's see what I mean about the month of like this was fine. I like medical memoirs. Um, Adam Kay's This Is Gonna Hurt is my favourite and I feel like this book Critical probably came off the heels of that book having so much success. It's one of the many medical memoirs that have kind of sprung up since that book. Um, it is interesting if you are generally interested in science biology human anatomy and it does a good job of explaining some of the different reasons why you might end up in an IC unit and the kind of different ways that a body deals with intensive trauma in different ways and what um what kind of uh problems doctors in an IC unit face like what are their main kind of battles but I feel like um, there was a lot of navel gazing at points. Uh, Matt Morgan was very keen to sort of convey the importance of human life and like not taking things for granted. And there was like a life lesson in every sort of character. And also he just didn't go into much detail about a lot of the cases. It's quite a short book. Um, and I was just kind of expecting a little bit more from it. So interesting enough if you like medicine, but not really the place to start for medical memoirs. The next book I finished is The City of Dreaming Books by Walter Mowers. This is book three in his World of Zemonia, which is um, like, a similar to Terry Pratchett absurdist fantasy where each individual book follows a different set of characters but they're all set within the same kind of global world so you can read them out of sequence if you want this one in particular follows um, a dinosaur style creature called Optimus Yarn Spinner who comes from a castle known for creating literary greats and he goes to the infamous city of Bukholm which is entirely made up of uh, bookshops and things connected to books and reading and in doing so he's actually going to look for a mysterious author whose work he has an example of and he desperately wants to track them down because it is the best book he's ever read and in doing so he gets embroiled in the underworld of this book world and kind of gets gets thrown into this labyrinth that is underneath the city filled with all sorts of terrible and terrifying creatures connected with books. I love Walter Mowers. I think if you're a fan of somebody like Terry Pratchett you definitely need to not sleep on him because he is so good at the weird absurdist fun fantasy. This is definitely one of his more manageable titles. It's a lot shorter than some of the other ones in the series and I do think it keeps itself a bit kind of tighter and neater than some of them. In some ways though that was one thing that like I enjoy it when they sprawl around a little bit more. 
but this one was really cool and the um narrative of like books and the love of reading um was such a nice um sort of setting for this book and if you're a fan of reading which of course you are because why not are you here otherwise you would definitely appreciate this because it really was kind of um heartwarming when thinking about why individuals read books in the first place so really lovely the next book i finished is the girl in red by christina henry this is a ya re fairy tale retelling looking at the fairy tale of red riding hood but setting it in a post-apocalyptic future so we live in a world where a virus that targets your respiratory system has caused a global pandemic little close to home but that's okay i feel like we've now reached the stage of this pandemic where i can start reading these kind of books again um and red basically is on a cross-country trip to try and get to her grandparents house who lives in sort of this secluded area and she believes that she will be safe once she gets there and it's about the people that she meets along the way this one was fine it's probably my least favorite of all the christina henry's again we're back with the just it was fine like fine um it kind of hit all the standard beats that you would expect a post-apocalyptic book to hit and I think it does them okay. There was a weird departure and kind of twist towards the end of the book that I definitely didn't feel was necessary. I won't say what it is so I don't spoil it but that went off on left field and I don't think it explored that idea particularly well nor was that idea particularly needed and it doesn't really end as so many of these post-apocalyptic books don't because it's quite hard to end something where the world's gone to shit but i did enjoy the character of red i think that she's really interesting as a character and i also really enjoyed the fact that she um she has a disability she is missing part of her leg and has a prosthetic and i thought that that was um interesting for the book to explore because it was kind of a constant presence but at no point was it a really major like defining plot point um i can't speak to how well it represents not having a leg because i have both of mine so I can't say whether it was good or not but I appreciated that fact of her character um so yeah so I'm not like I still like Christina Henry but I don't think that this was her most interesting take on a fairy tale out there we are getting there I only have two more books to talk about there was a lot of novellas this month that's kind of bumped my uh, reading slightly and on the note of novellas I also read The Test by Sylvain Nouveau this is a sci-fi novella from the author of The Themis Files which is a cracking sci-fi trilogy go check it out review link down below but this one is about a gentleman who is taking a citizenship test when suddenly there is a like hold up and kind of hostage situation in the center itself i don't want to say much more than that because uh, i don't want to spoil anything else but let's just say it takes a major twist and was very very interesting and i think quite well done this sort of falls into the category of sci-fi novellas where i would consider them to be almost dramatized thought experiments and kind of dramatized philosophical and ethical um dilemmas where you're sort of seeing what different people would do in different settings so because of that the plot isn't necessarily massively the strongest it's more using this as a space to explore ethical principles and philosophical ideas which is a style of sci-fi novella that i love um and i may do a whole separate video on novellas like this once I've got a couple more under my belt um, but some people might find it satisfying but I think it's well written well executed and I had a really good time reading it and then the final book I finished is We Were Eight Years in Power by ta Coates this is a non-fiction collection of essays which ta Coates wrote throughout the time of the Obama administration as well as for each one of the essays a chapter before it where he kind of reflects on the essay how it was sort of met within the um, political landscape what was happening in his life at the time and would he do anything different differently and then the final section of the book is talking about um, the rise of Trump after Obama and what that really says about America. Tana Hussey Coates is a black man and it is about him talking about Obama and Obama's connection with the black community and what that meant about racism in America. It is phenomenally well written. Tana Hussey Coates has the most glorious writing style like this is definitely a, an author that I can see becoming a firm favourite and I'm really interested to check out more of his work but I also found all of the um, essays very very interesting and um, kind of showing very sort of each one was very very different in its nature there were a few that crossed over with information that I already knew about so some of the more like data heavy ones talking about um, policing and the militarization of policing in um, America and also mass incarceration just is something that I already have been reading about and sort of learning about in podcast form more so that happened to cross over which meant that i just personally didn't find them as interesting but that's not a problem because if you aren't aware of those tarnhasi coach does it very very well and the rest of the um 
essays were incredible. I really loved his ones on the case for reparations and also talking about Michelle as the kind of classic American woman. So fascinating, very interesting, 100% recommend. Okay, that's it. We did it. We got through the whole wrap up. Um, have you added any of these to your TBR? Uh, yeah, generally tell me all the comments down below. I'm sorry, I feel very out of it now that I've just talked about that many books. So I'm gonna go make myself a cup of tea and then film something else most likely. Have a wonderful reading week and I'll chat to you soon. Bye!